Hey guys, it's Josh and I'm back. This time we're going to talk about carbon capture and sequestration. And so hopefully you've watched or will plan to watch my other videos on our YouTube playlist dealing with carbon's journey through Earth systems. And in this video, we're going to combine both of our knowledge of the carbon cycle and the consequences of having the carbon cycle reservoirs unbalanced uh, to discuss mitigation strategies aimed at rebalancing the reservoirs of the carbon cycle. Let's begin by closely looking at the chemistry of the element carbon. Atomic number six on the periodic table of elements can be found in the non-metal group. These are white elements over here. That's where carbon's at. Uh, it's a, its atomic structure is what makes carbon a basic building block of many molecules. And so this atom is readily able to form covalent bonds with other nonmetals. Okay, so the atomic number six indicates the identity of carbon. So its six protons is what makes, well, carbon carbon. So the average atomic mass is 12.01, which gives you a rough idea of uh, what the most abundant isotope of carbon is. And so carbon has many isotopes, but only a few are stable enough to exist for long periods of time on Earth. And so one PHET's build an atom simulation, we can not only make all of those isotopes, but we can also observe the key component behind carbon's bonding, its electron arrangement. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do is add protons until we've got a carbon atom. And so since the atomic number is six, we need six protons. One proton would mean we have the atom of hydrogen. Two protons, we would have helium. Three, we'd, we'd have the element lithium. Four, beryllium. Five is boron. Six is carbon. Now, without any neutrons, the mass of this carbon uh, particle that we have is six. And so uh, we'll add some neutrons here. So that, that changes the mass number to seven. I add a second neutron, the mass number becomes eight. And if I turn on this little option, we can see that these isotopes of carbon are unstable. So they don't exist for long. They go through radioactive decay and become a different element through that process. And so here we've got carbon nine, 10, 11, and then carbon 12 is going to be our first stable isotope. We even have carbon 13, carbon 14, and so much more, but you can see carbon 14 is unstable. So there's too much, uh, too much stuff in the nucleus there for the binding energy to hold it together, it makes it uh, radioactive. And so let's go back down to our most common isotope, which is carbon-12. Now, without any electrons, the charge is unbalanced. Notice our net charge is plus six. And so this means that we actually have an ion of carbon instead of an atom. So if we're going to discuss the atom of carbon and its bonding properties, we need to make sure that we have an atom. And so uh, let's add our electrons and watch here. Uh, according to Bohr's model of the atom, two of the electrons will occupy the first energy level. And then when I add my third electron, instead of going to the first energy level, it's going to move up to the second energy level. And so according to Bohr's model, we can hold a total of eight electrons in this second energy level. You can see at four, we're already neutral. I'm just going to add a fifth one. Notice now we have a negative ion instead of a positive ion. I'm going to add all of these electrons to show you that they all fit. This is when the second energy level becomes full. So let's take out these four extra electrons that are not in an atom of carbon. Okay, so now we have a net charge of zero. We have a neutral atom. And I'm just going to shift the electrons around a little bit so they're not all scrunched up. There we go. So we've got uh, two electrons in the first energy level and in the outermost energy level for carbon, which we often call the valence 
uh, energy level or the valence electrons here in the outermost energy level, uh, we have four of them. And so remember we had a total of eight that could fit there. And so what that means is carbon has four open spots uh, here that uh, basically allow for bonding to take place. So let's go through some of these rules for bonding basics. First of all, electrons, like you saw in the simulation, fill uh, these orbitals from the lowest energy to the highest energy needed to reside within that orbital, right? They, they don't want to spend extra energy to be there if they don't have to. They're going to be uh, as lazy, I guess you could say, as possible. And so that means they're going to start feeling closest to the nucleus. It takes less energy to be there. And then uh, the second rule here is that electron orbitals can contain two electrons each. And so that's why I've drawn these boxes together. Each box is where an electron will go. And I put these boxes in pairs. And so these electron pairs make up a single orbital. And so in the first energy level, we have one orbital. And remember, according to Bohr's model, only two electrons will fit in the first energy level. So we only have one orbital there. And then the second energy level has four different orbitals. So a total of eight electrons. And then the third rule, electrons are, are all negatively charged, right? They all have, this, have a similar charge, the same charge. And what do we know about charges that are similar? Well, they like to repel one another, right? They're not attracted to one another like opposite charges are. And so electrons are going to prefer to jump to different orbitals that don't have any electrons in them uh, within their energy level before they decide to pair up with another one. And so let's take a look here at the, the filling sequence again of carbon. So we've got our first electron and then our second electron is going to go into that same orbital because there's no other orbital for it to occupy at that energy level. And then our second energy level, we start with our third electron. Now our fourth electron, instead of being paired in the same orbital, it's going to want to move over here uh, into a different orbital that's not occupied. Same thing with the next electron. And then the last electron for a neutral atom of carbon is gonna occupy that last orbital. And so we've got four open spaces, right? This is, this is what allows carbon to easily form those covalent bonds with other nonmetals. Okay, and so just to shorten things up here, instead of drawing this entire Bohr model uh, for these electrons, I'm just going to represent the valence electrons uh, through, through this drawing known as a Lewis structure, right? And so we, we've learned that these valence electrons are what are responsible for all of the chemical and reactions that happen in chemical bonding and, and chemical changes. That occur. And so knowing how many vacancies you have and also how many electrons are there uh, is important. And so I'm going to just draw those four valence electrons around carbon. And notice I position them to kind of indicate that there are open spaces in these orbitals. Now carbon in nature, there's a lot of different forms. Carbon can exist by itself only as carbon atoms and many different shapes and varieties, what we call allotropes, right? Different allotropes of carbon. So we can have amorphous carbon, graphite, and diamond. Now, when carbon wants to bond with hydrogen, instead of other carbon atoms, it wants to bond with a hydrogen atom, it can create organic compounds such as methane. And then it can also bond with oxygen atoms. And so when oxygen bonds with carbon, we can get things like carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, which is, really the main component of conversation here in this video, right? And of course, there are many other types of bonds that carbon makes as well. We're just gonna focus on these to get you started. So these are uh, 3D structures of, of carbon chains and carbon rings. So we start out with forming a chain or a ring and we can build upon these chains and rings to make much larger, you know, samples uh, of carbon containing or carbon only substances. And so let me just explain how we get to these chains. 
And so when two carbon atoms are, you know, in, in position to bond with one another, what's going to happen is they're going to have to share their electrons with one another to fill these vacancies in their valence shell. And so what we'll see here between these two carbon atoms, the one on the left is going to share its electron in its valence shell with the carbon atom on the right. And the carbon atom on the right is going to also do that with its electron uh, that it's going to share with the other carbon atom. And so this is one bond that takes place. They decide to share these two electrons to create a bond. This is a single bond. And they're going to redraw it like this. So this is the beginning framework of making a chain. I can stick another carbon atom over here on the side and make the chain a, a three chain carbon. I can go to a four chain carbon and even larger, right? So here we've got a four chain carbon and you'll notice that there are still vacancies for some other element to come in and create a covalent bond similar to how carbon bonds with itself. And we can even add other carbons on the top or the bottom of these chains to make branches coming off of these chains. And so that's how some of these chains can start looking much more complex, even, um, you know, in, in, in these uh, round shapes, they, you can form these rings of carbon. But carbon's not the only thing that can form those bonds. Hydrogen can as well. And so we take a look at the formation of methane. Well, it's going to contain a carbon atom and four hydrogen atoms. And so a hydrogen atom, remember atomic number one for hydrogen, means it's got one proton. It may have a neutron. It may not have a neutron. It may have a couple neutrons. Just depends on which isotope. Uh, but remember, the most important thing in bonding are those valence electrons. And so there's only one electron in a neutral atom of hydrogen. And so that means it can't even entirely fill the first energy level. We just have one electron there in that orbital. And so I, again, I can shortcut that and draw my Lewis structure like this. When we talk about uh, bonding here, so if we have our, our carbon atom with its four spaces available to generate this uh, covalent bond, hydrogen has one, right? It's got an open space and it's got one electron that can exchange uh, to make this sharing occur. And so it's going to share its electron with carbon and carbon is going to share one of its electrons to help stabilize its outer shell. And they're going to bond make a covalent bond like this. And so if we add three more hydrogen atoms to this and create a bond in each one of these bonding sites, then we get the molecule of methane. And so these things happen very naturally on our planet. It's very easy for, for this type of bond to take place and exist. Now it's changing these bonds that uh, is involving some energy, right? And so this is this will be pretty stable unless some something happens to cause a chemical reaction to take place. Now let's take a look at when oxygen bonds with carbon. So we're going to take a look at the oxygen atom, of course, just like with hydrogen. Uh, now oxygen's got eight protons, which means in a neutral atom, again, I'm just ignoring the neutrons uh, for the sake of this conversation, but to balance out the charge, we need to have eight electrons as well. And so we're going to fill them up, first the two inner ones, and then one in each orbital. And then that means two more electrons in the second energy level. So one would go to this orbital, one would go to this orbital, leaving an open spot in these last two orbitals in the valence shell of oxygen. And so there are two bonding sites uh, on each oxygen atom. Right. And of course, I'm going to use this um, Lewis structure version to, to talk about the bonding principles here behind carbon and oxygen bonding. And so we've got a carbon and oxygen atom. You can easily see already that right away we're going to have a single bond formed here in the middle. So our single bond forms. But what we also have uh, uh, on oxygen is another spot here for a covalent bond to form. And carbon also has another spot for uh, bonding to take place. And so these atoms are already attached to one another. And so they're in close proximity. So it's a it's pretty easy 
uh, to imagine that these electrons are going to be close enough for this interaction to take place. And so what we'll see is another bond. This is a second bond between the same two atoms. This is a, what we would call a double bond, right? A double covalent bond forms here. So this is just the overall schematic, again, of that bonding process. So we first had our single bond form, and then our, our second bond formed, creating a double bond between carbon and oxygen. Now, our oxygen is satisfied over here. It's got no more vacancies, but the carbon still has two more. And so if you do the math really quickly and think about that, that means we can throw in another oxygen atom to satisfy that carbon. Uh, that has the two openings because we know that each oxygen molecule has two openings in its valence shell for this bonding to take place. And so that's very common, uh, something that would happen when oxygen is available. We're having another oxygen atom go through that same process, forming a single bond between these two electrons, and then these two electrons uh, here are going to also share and create a second bond. So we'll have another double bond. So here's our finished product. We've got carbon in the center holding this molecule together. It's sharing every one of its four electrons with an, with an electron on an oxygen atom to create these four bonds. So this is a pretty stable molecule now. It's, it's good, it's happy to be bonding here. Okay, so if you haven't watched the video yet or played this game that I created on Scratch called the Carbon Journey Game, uh, make sure that you find it on the YouTube playlist here. Check it out, learn how to play the game, give it a try uh, because it's really fun and you do learn a lot whenever you play the game. Now, in the game, what you will learn or if you've already played the game, what we have learned are a few important things to talk about before we get into carbon sequestration. And that's, first of all, carbon dioxide naturally exchanges from reservoir to reservoir through the carbon cycle. And that could be the atmosphere reservoir uh, being pulled in by land plants to do photosynthesis. And then land plants are then eaten by land animals. And so that carbon is then uh, used to create energy for that organism, and then it changes the, the carbon into carbon dioxide again, and the carbon dioxide is released back into the atmosphere. And so these, these are different reservoirs here that carbon is moving through when these processes happen. Carbon can also be dissolved into the ocean from the atmosphere. In fact, you have a pretty good chance if you're a carbon dioxide molecule in the atmosphere that you're gonna go through that dissolving process and be put into the ocean. And then through some processes we're gonna talk about in a minute, you can end up uh, in marine organisms. And then if that marine organism, that reservoir maybe dies, something happens to it and it, you know, it's gonna start sinking down to the bottom of the ocean where it's going to have things sitting on top of it after a while. Other things are gonna fall down and bury it. So as this sediment buries and buries it, uh, it moves it into another reservoir, the earth, right? Just the ground itself. And so this is one way that fossil fuels are created. We're gonna talk about that in more detail in a minute. And then those fossil fuels could be mined and extracted by humans, combust it uh, to generate energy or to do any type of manufacturing whatsoever through these uh, processes that generates carbon dioxide again and uh, puts it back into the atmosphere. Okay, so th this is just the exchange of carbon from its many different forms, from an allotrope of carbon, maybe into a molecule of carbon like carbon dioxide or methane. All uh, of this uh, carbon moves through these paths and, and can change into different forms. But ultimately what we are concerned about is how we have become unbalanced, right? That humans have extracted a lot of fossil fuels uh, and have put a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, more than what 
maybe is naturally something that we would want in our carbon, uh, our carbon levels in the atmosphere. Also, humans are responsible for deforestation, which takes out land plants, which are known as another reservoir that would hold carbon dioxide. Right, so when they do photosynthesis, they convert the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere into uh, plant matter itself. And so uh, it's kind of fixed in that reservoir. Now, when forest fires occur, we also introduce carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. Whenever humans burn the, you know, the forest or destroy the forest, they could also uh, cause that to happen. And so we've got the problem here of how do we get this large amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere safely stored somewhere so that way we don't have the problem of potential global warming and climate change as a result of this unbalanced carbon cycle. So let's talk chemically about combustion and deforestation and also we'll move into some of those other exchange processes. So uh, carbon from fossil fuels in the ground and also land plants uh, to the atmosphere go through the combustion process. So deforestation and combustion is very similar chemical reaction I'm just showing the combustion process of octane. So like gasoline in your automobile has a lot of octane. And so you'll notice we've got these long chain carbon atoms and branches coming off of, or carbon molecules, I'm sorry, branches coming off the, the carbon molecules here. And so even though we've only got two molecules of octane in, to make this reaction happen, that's, an, that's eight carbon atoms per molecule, right? And so the air, which has an awful lot of oxygen in it, could very easily supply 25 oxygen molecules for this reaction to take place. And so we need, we need a lot of oxygen and we need a spark of energy to ignite this, to ignite this octane fuel. And when that happens, the bonds holding those carbon atoms together and also these oxygen uh, bonds, double bond oxygens, together here, they're going to break with that heat. And that's going to allow those atoms to realign themselves. Remember back those pictures I showed you how easy it was for carbon and oxygen and two oxygen uh, atoms at that to form and create carbon dioxide. It happens very easily. Now, hydrogen and some of this extra oxygen that doesn't go into the carbon or bond with the carbon to make carbon dioxide is going to make water molecules. And so we're going to get 16 carbon dioxide molecules and 18 carbon or 18 hydrogen sorry 18 water molecules every time uh, this reaction happens once and so you can imagine that's just two two molecules of, of octane so imagine how many molecules are actually in your gas tank whenever you are driving around right so we get a lot of carbon dioxide out of that, and a lot of water molecules. We've got the same number of atoms, the same type of atoms. They've just been chemically restructured into new molecules. And those new molecules have different properties, right? Water and carbon dioxide are both greenhouse gases. Uh, of course, water can uh, exchange out of the atmosphere by precipitation very easily. Uh, carbon dioxide, not always the case, right? It's going to have a longer lifetime in the atmosphere. And so its properties of being a greenhouse gas are going to be more felt. All right, the second process that we talked about on the carbon journey cycle uh, slide was photosynthesis and respiration. So again, land plants first pull in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and also get water from the ground. That's kind of why the the colors here are different. Uh, and they they chemically react this with sunlight. So sunlight's kind of the energy that allows this to take place to produce glucose. So that's this big carbon, hydrogen, oxygen containing uh, molecule. And uh, also molecular oxygen. So the stuff in the atmosphere that we breathe in as humans is produced by plants. So right, it, this is a good thing. We we remove carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and we 
effectively add oxygen into the atmosphere. Great. Win-win, right? But yes, but you got to also realize that land animals need to eat plants. So they, to get this glucose as a food source, and in order to digest that, oh, sorry, I forgot to show you my glucose molecule. Here it is. So this is a long uh, six carbon molecule here with a lot of oxygens and hydrogens. And so when these two react, we need six oxygen molecules, the same six that were maybe generated in this first reaction, right? The same amount is then consumed as, you know, land animals breathe in oxygen from the air. And then that allows for their stomachs to generate something called adenosine triphosphate or ATP, which is the energy that allows for the animal to survive. And then it also produces carbon dioxide and water molecules. So again, the end result here is carbon dioxide back in the atmosphere, and we also have some water that's created as well. So that was actually oversimplified, but um, let's go back to remembering things we learned about the carbon journey. Another thing that we learned in that game was that there was a fast loop and a slow loop and then a very slow uh, part of the carbon loop. And so what do I mean by fast, slow, and then very slow? Well, that just means the rate at which those chemical processes take place to move the carbon from one place to another reservoir, right? From one reservoir to another reservoir. And so the fast loop is the main reservoir is the atmosphere. And then these other reservoirs will quickly pull the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and then maybe move it to another reservoir and then eventually back to the atmosphere very quickly. So the time scale here is days, right, to minutes, very quick processes. And all of these quick reservoirs are at the surface of the earth or along the surface of the earth. Now our slow carbon loop are reservoirs that are the big ocean, the earth itself and things within the ocean. So underneath of the earth's surface, uh, are where the slow carbon loops go. And so, uh, again, these processes take a very long time to, from weeks to months to years to millions of years for the very slow exchanges in purple to take place. And so this is a good place for us to want to put carbon dioxide uh, to change it into carbon containing fossil fuels and things because it gets it out of the atmosphere and then we don't have to worry about uh, any consequences of the carbon dioxide being in the atmosphere, such as, you know, global warming and also climate change. Except there is one thing here that you should also consider. Carbon dioxide in the ocean, as opposed to being in fossil fuels, is not that great of a thing. Uh, but, the, but these two locations, the ocean, the ground, are actually reservoirs that link directly back to the atmosphere, right, in this carbon journey. So in green here are our links between the fast loop and the slow loop. And so first of all, the ocean, uh, whenever we pull carbon dioxide into the ocean, we, we generate carbonic acid, which makes the ocean more acidic. And if the ocean becomes too acidic, animals and plants in the ocean that are not tolerant to those pHs are going to die out. And that's going to cause a separate problem. Uh, and so uh, something to keep in mind here, though, is you can actually be outgassed if you are a carbon dioxide molecule and are absorbed or dissolved into the ocean, you have a pretty good chance of, there's 83% chance you're going to stay in the ocean dissolved there, and there's 17% chance that you're going to go back into the atmosphere. So uh, this exchange is two ways, back and forth, but mostly it's into the ocean, right? The overall result here is into the ocean. Now we talked about, we're gonna talk more in detail how that carbon dioxide in the ocean can work its way down into the very slow reservoir uh, to make fossil fuels, which is a pretty good thing. Uh, but 
Also keep in mind that when we extract those fossil fuels and combust them, that we're putting it very quickly back into the fast loop. And so a process that takes millions of years to create and then to instantly pull it back out and, and put it into the, into the atmosphere is not a viable solution to our problem. Okay, and so the first thing here is we get into talking about these routes into long-term reservoirs, right? That, that's ultimately the goal. We wanna store carbon out of the atmosphere for a very long time. And so we know through the law of conservation of mass, we can't just make the carbon disappear, even if that's something we would even want to do. Uh, it's gotta exist in our universe somehow. And so the first thing though I wanna mention is, uh, in another video in our in the ocean acidification module on this YouTube channel, the NASA IV and VRC YouTube channel, uh, there are some videos talking about uh, ocean acidification, some really cool activities that you can do related to learning about pH and ocean acidification. So check those out if you want to learn more about uh, that atmosphere to ocean process. The second thing here is uh, once the carbon dioxide is in the ocean, phytoplankton will absorb it to perform photosynthesis. And then other organisms that eat phytoplankton in their food web are going to do that and that carbon is going to transfer into those marine organisms. And then when those organisms die, they will sink to the ocean floor, be buried by sediments, and form a very waxy carbon compound known as kerogen. And whenever more sediment builds up on top of that kerogen, uh, it increases the heat uh, of that substance, which causes it to melt and form oil and natural gas. And we're gonna show you some models of how that happens in a minute. And then something very similar happens with ocean plants, right? Ocean plants, seaweed and things are gonna pull in carbon dioxide from the ocean to do photosynthesis again. And when those things die and get buried, they're gonna create, instead of kerogen, that waxy compound, they're gonna make something called peat. And then peat is going to eventually turn into coal. And so oil, natural gas, and coal are all carbon containing substances in the Earth's geosphere uh, that, that can be made naturally uh, by the Earth through this carbon journey uh, process or the carbon cycle, I should say. So this is just a little schematic of the phytoplankton being grazed upon after they use the carbon dioxide to, to survive. And then, of course, eventually these marine organisms will, will die and then they'll sink to the bottom of the ocean where they can be covered up and produce kerogen. And so you can see inside of this rock, this uh, waxy-like substance here known as kerogen. And here's the big molecule kerogen. You can see there are lots of carbon atoms in this molecule, right? They're, Every little point, it doesn't mark every little C, it shows you where sulfur is, nitrogen is. Well, imagine everywhere where there's just a point and no letter, that there's actually the letter C there. And coming off of that, that letter C are some hydrogen atoms as well. But there are a lot of carbon atoms in these rings. There are six in each ring, right? In each chain, there's a one, two, three, four, five, six carbon atoms off this chain. So there's a lot of carbon atoms within this substance. And so when that waxy substance melts under the pressure of the sediment, it's going to eventually turn into uh, natural gas, right, or petroleum. And so here's the little model of that happening. These are diamonds, but they're, they're supposed to represent marine organisms, maybe fish or something. And then the black here are organisms that have died. And so carbon in the tissue of those dead organisms, what we say they deposit on the ocean floor. They just kind of work their way down and they sit there. And then salt, sand, other sediment that also eventually gets deposited as it gets too heavy in the ocean water, it's gonna cover up these dead organisms and that's gonna apply pressure and heat and allow for that uh, kerogen to, or any carbon containing substance like in the peat to eventually be squeezed, right? And so it's gonna change it chemically. And so the kerogen melts and makes big pools of crude oil that's trapped inside of these other layers that are impermeable, right? It's, so this is a good reservoir for those things. 
that we will eventually mine out to use them, right? If we're thinking about uh, an industry there. And so here's just a model of how plants will turn into peat. And then when they are uh, covered up by other sediment, they eventually turn into a coal called lignite, a very low grade of coal. And then that lignite can actually metamorph uh, go through metamorphosis and and turn in or met you know like a different type of metamorphic rock called bituminous coal, right? And so it's just a higher grade of coal, and then more heat and pressure uh, and metamorphosis can change that bituminous coal into a higher grade of coal known as uh, anthracite. So this is just a really good photo of uh, those different forms. We could see peat here. Here's a, some lignite. And then that lignite will turn into a higher grade, uh, or turn into coal, I should say, a bituminous coal. And then we can get into higher grades of coal. Okay, so we just talked about the pathway to that very slow reservoir. And that can take millions of years for the sediment to be buried and to cause those changes into those fossil fuels. Uh, and so it's gonna take a long time for them to be ready for extraction to actually uh, go back into the atmosphere. Uh, and But really the, the issue that we're having, right, is relying too much on this reservoir uh, for our lives, our human lives. And so humans are really responsible for how much carbon dioxide gets put into the atmosphere. And that puts it back into that quick carbon loop, by the way, which means the carbon is going to remain up here in the atmosphere uh, for longer periods of time than uh, what it would be, you know, working its way back down into this very slow uh, part of the slow loop. So mitigation strategies. What can humans do to mitigate, you know, this, this imbalance in the carbon cycle? And so we're gonna talk about the CCS chain, carbon capture and storage. And so carbon capture is the process of, of taking, uh, you know, carbon either before, during, or after the combustion process from these fuels uh, and preventing carbon dioxide from entering the atmosphere in the first place. So holding on to it and then compressing that carbon dioxide into the liquid phase so that it can be transported somewhere. So that's the transport part of the CCS chain. And so transporting is moving the liquid pressurized carbon dioxide uh, by pipeline or by boat to be used. So we call it carbon util utilization. There are a lot of uses for carbon dioxide. Um, or if it can't be you know, used for anything, sold to somebody to manufacture or mix something, uh, to make some type of product, it can then be stored. And so storage is the last part of this CCS chain. And that's an attempt to use carbon dioxide to produce something chemically uh, that changes the carbon dioxide into an entirely new carbon containing substance. And so the carbon then is chemically fixed to other atoms in, inside of its chemical structure and prevents it from being a gas in the atmosphere. So that's really what we're going to talk about here. So that's that's what we mean by carbon sequestration, sequestering it away so that it can't interact uh, any longer as a gas in the atmosphere. And so this is our current carbon capture techniques. The first technique is pre-combustion capture. And so that's where a solid liquid or gaseous fuel uh, is converted into a mixture of hydrogen and carbon dioxide. Uh, the carbon dioxide is stripped out of that mixture and is then sent into a compressor to be transported. And so that's that's combusting it, you know, within within the within the building that you're doing these combustion processes with. You try to safely collect it so that you can then compress it. That's pre pre combustion capture. Post combustion capture uh, is 
uh, when carbon dioxide is caught as it's exiting the exhaust. So like think of maybe like a power plant where the carbon dioxide would be coming out. It's catching it there in that phase, absorbing it into a solvent. And then that mixture then is moved to a chamber, again, where carbon dioxide is pulled out, like in the pre-combustion uh, process, uh, and then is stripped uh, from that mixture, compressed and ready for transport. And then the third thing here uh, is oxyfuel combustion. And so that's when oxygen in the air is pulled out from the combustion chamber. Remember, we need a lot of oxygen for combustion to take place. So if we remove some of that oxygen, uh, the chances of making carbon dioxide are then reduced. And so the exhaust gas from the combustion chamber can then be recycled back into this system within the, the plant and used again during combustion. You can get a more pure product uh, of gas containing carbon dioxide. It's easier to isolate this way. And then you can use water to dissolve the carbon dioxide and make it easier uh, for it to be compressed like in these other phases. So all very similar phases. It's just the way that the, the operations collect it, right? Either before, after the combustion takes place, or just by the way that you are performing the combustion process. Okay, and so transporting. What do we do after we compress this into liquid carbon dioxide? Where do we move it and, and how? So these are pipelines coming out of this uh, plant here. And so some plants are already in a, in a location where it's geologically favorable for them to pump this in the ground beneath them and it's stored there below the surface of the ground for a long time. Now, the most common route is carbon dioxide is compressed to about eight megapascals. That's a pressure, high pressure. Uh, and then transport it through these pipelines to other locations. And so maybe a tank would want a boat at 0.7 megapascals of pressure, would move it across the ocean to a different place where it can be used for something, or even by train. Uh, and so there you got to cool the, the gas to negative 20 degrees Celsius and have it at a pressure of two megapascals so that it can safely be on trains and, and move across the countries. Now, where, what, are we, what am I introducing to you guys today in this video? We're going to talk about the salt carbon sequestration. Now, there's another video uh, where you can watch uh, if you haven't already, uh, an expert talk about this technique and they've got this model created uh, to demonstrate how this works. And so, of course, we've got our ocean water here on the top and then about uh, 3,000 or so meters beneath the ocean, uh, we've got our first sediment layer and it's about 200 meters thick, right? And so beneath that is a basalt layer that has no pores. And then another variety of basalt that does have pores is called vesicular basalt. And, and so the honeycomb cereal here is showing the opening spaces, whereas the Hershey bars here are showing no opening spaces of basalt. Chemically, the same rock, uh, physically structured a bit different so that uh, you can actually fit stuff in, the, in these pores, right? Ocean water, you can put dissolved liquids in it, or dissolved get carbon dioxide that has liquids in it. And that's, that's the goal of this basalt carbon sequestration is that carbon dioxide that is pumped down through the ocean. So we drill through the ocean sediment layers down beneath this basalt layer and pump in that compressed CO2 here with some water. And what will happen is, is that it stays stored in this permeable layer of basalt and then the non-permeable permeable layer of basalt above it traps it there, keeps it from rising back up into the ocean. And so basalt is the key rock to do this with. It can't just be any rock, and it's not, it's not entirely due to the pore space of the vesicular basalt. It's actually the chemical composition of the basalt that's favorable, right? And so basalt is an igneous rock. That means that it's formed from uh, cooling lava or magma. 
And uh, it's a mafic rock, which means it's high in magnesium and iron and low in silica. And so it also has this dark color because of the, the magnesium and iron content in the rock. So what are the chemical components of this rock? Well, a lot of magnesium oxide and calcium oxide make up this rock. And like I said, very small amount of silica. So, and then some iron oxide and aluminum oxide are also in the rock. Now the magnesium oxide is the key component in this basalt. And so since it's found a lot in, in basalt, it's, it's pretty, it makes it pretty favorable for, for this use because not only are we going to drill and store the carbon dioxide in the rock layer, but the carbon dioxide can chemically react in this, in this form with magnesium oxide. Okay, so let's take a look at the chemical steps involved in carbon sequestration that happens with the salt and dissolved carbon dioxide that's pumped into it. So first of all, magnesium oxide as a solid, uh, when, it, when it's in contact with water, it, it will react and form uh, magnesium hydroxide. Okay, and so whenever we have magnesium hydroxide uh, in the rock, with the carbon dioxide that's you know, pumped down in uh, with this water, at three to five uh, atmospheres of pressure and below 50 degrees Celsius, which is very easily obtained in these locations, uh, they will chemically react to form magnesium uh, bicarbonate. Now, this aqueous bi uh, magnesium bicarbonate will uh, easily uh, ionize into magnesium ions and two bicarbonate ions. So remember, it takes two carbon dioxide molecules for this, this step to take place. And so once you have, uh, have it in there, it's you know, chemically fixed now or sequestered in this bicarbonate ion. Now, what could happen also is uh, these things could react back and form magnesium carbonate and an oxygen molecule. And so two things to keep in mind here. We have subtracted this or divided, we should say, divide in half the amount of carbon dioxide that was there in the gas form, right? So even though it does, it's not a perfect system, it effectively removes carbon dioxide that was in this mixture that was pumped down in there and changes it chemically into the rock magnesium carbonate. So the composition of the rock is changed to this through this process. Now there's carbon dioxide produced, but remember it's in the impermeable layer, or, or sorry, it's beneath the impermeable layer of basalt. And so it's trapped. And so this means this carbon dioxide has an opportunity to react again with magnesium hydroxide to help accelerate this process a little bit. So this is kind of the research that's going on on how, how this works and, and uh, if it's effective or not. And so what this means is pumping doesn't involve dissolving the water directly into the ocean, which was the problem we have with this ocean acidification and instead, it's a direct route right into the very slow pathway, right? And it, I mean, it's not a fossil fuel per se, it doesn't generate a fossil fuel, but instead it stores it there in a, in a very permanent, even more permanent way than fossil fuel creation. And so this is the, the goal here of carbon sequestration, so removing that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and storing it down here in that very slow reservoir where cooling it out isn't really something that any human is going to want to do because it's not gonna be a fossil fuel. Okay. 
Okay, so these are the references that I have to share with you guys. And I just wanna say thank you so much for watching uh, this video. I hope that you learned something and I hope that you're interested in learning more. Uh, you can check out the ocean acidification videos on this channel, or you can check out uh, any of the carbon journey videos that I, I have available. So I uh, hope to hear from you guys and, and hope to see that you've learned something. Uh, if you have questions, you can always email me.